International Women's Day remains just as relevant as when it was founded in 1909. It marks the achievements of women past and present and continues to celebrate its campaign to end discrimination. On a global stage and on the home front, there's still plenty of work to be done to achieve equality for all women from all walks of life. This evening's public lecture will be chaired by Joyce Macmillan, theatre crit critic of The Scotsman. She's been a freelance journalist based in Edinburgh for more than 25 years and involved in many campaigns for democracy and human rights, both in Scotland and internationally. She regularly writes political and social commentary column. I will now ask Joyce McMillan to introduce Philippa Gregory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Waterhouse. Um, and it's a tremendous honour and indeed a delight as well as an honour uh, to be here today to chair this uh, International Women's Day lecture by um, Philippa Gregory. Um, as the ranger said, um, there was a time perhaps, or as she hinted, there was a time perhaps a couple of decades ago when we began to think that there might one day no longer be a need for anything like an International Women's Day when we felt as if there had been a big battle over feminism and women's rights and the battle um, had been won. But certainly I think over the last half decade or more, there has been something of a harsh wake-up call to anyone who might um, have thought that. I think we learned internationally and um, here at home just how easy it is for women's position, particularly in public life, um, to slip backwards if we don't um, keep on keeping on and make sure that we continue to organise and argue uh, for the full partic participation of women um, in the public world. The Scottish Parliament, for instance, began with a tremendous proportion of women back in 1999. We are near 40% now, it's slid down to barely more than 30% just in two um, or three parliamentary elections. And of course, the proportions of women, as we all know, in boardrooms and in the Westminster Parliament are still pretty lamentable. And we hear men saying, well, it's 22% women, as if that was somehow fair, you know, as if that kind of represented the balance of ability between uh, men and women. And of course, whenever anyone talks about quotas, you hear people talking about how that would mean mediocre women being promoted, as if, as we all know, there has never, ever been a mediocre man promoted to a boardroom on the strength of something other than ability, and that's why they made such wonderful job of um, running the financial system up to 2008. <laughs> um, anyway, less of this feminist polemic for me, because my job today is to celebrate the fact that we still have an International Women's Day, to agree with Lorraine um, that, it, that, it is, um, is, that it is something that is as necessary um, and relevant as it ever was, and above all, um, to welcome and introduce to you uh, Philippa Gregory, one of the most distinguished alumni of this um, great um, university. Um, Philippa was born in Kenya back in the 1950s, and it says in Wikipedia, which one should never believe, that she was a rebellious schoolgirl, um, but nonetheless did well enough um, exam-wise to, to get into the University of Sussex. It was for her second degree that she came um, here to Edinburgh, completing a PhD in 18th century literature in this city. Um, and um, since then, she has gone on to become one of the most successful um, of all British, uh, living British uh, novelists. Um, her output has been formidable and, and impressive, and she is particularly famed, of course, for her great series of historic um, novels, of which there are several um, different strands. There are the Wineacre novels, which deal with kind of 18th century family stories. There's Earthly Joys, which is a pair of novels about a family of gardeners. There are probably most famously the Tudor um, histories, including the other volume girl, which was um, recently made into a film starring Scarlett um, and Johansson. And um, there's a whole series of novels about the Cousins of War, the Wars of the Roses. Um, there are seven other novels, including um, um, very well known and respectable trade, which is really a mighty study of the slave trade in Bristol in, um, in um, the 18th century. 
Um, there are children's books, uh, more than half a dozen of them, and short stories, and many other um, articles and contributions uh, to British public life. Um, so it's my absolute delight now um, to introduce to you um, your lecturer for tonight, the distinguished, the talented, and the uh, wonderfully articulate Philip Gray. <laughs> Who knew? Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. Thank you for inviting me here this evening. It's lovely to be in Edinburgh, especially on such a special day. I usually never talk about myself personally, nor about my family, but for once I will break this rule, and I'll start with my family. This is a picture of my great-great-great-great-great-aunt. <laughs> or at any rate, we know that she looks something like this, for though we have no portrait of her, this is how she was described by the 18th century writer and lover of beautiful things, Horace Walpole, who called her a hyena in petticoats. That's not good, but the romantic tender poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote of Hayes, to see a thing so ugly and petticoated, I do not stand it. Why, I wonder, should two men so hugely successful in their life and times pick on my great, 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 great aunt? because she was not a typical 18th century woman who sat over her embroidery and minded her manners. She was a writer, an historian, and a feminist. She was the dearest friend of Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women, one of the founding tracts of feminism. Mary Hayes herself wrote on religion, philosophy, and history, and was the first woman writer in the modern period to insist on writing a history of women. Her major work was female biography, or memoirs of illustrious and celebrated women of all ages and countries. And she wrote 300 pen portraits of the most extraordinary women of all time, from ancient Greek women poets to French scientists, published in six volumes by 1803. This was a massive piece of work by a woman who chose to live alone and support herself by her writing, who was banned, as were all women, from universities or professions. What she was trying to do was to bring to the attention of the world a female tradition of study, of achievement. She was trying to show that women were in the world and were making a difference to it. She was trying to create a road for woman that we no longer, like Lucy of the Wordsworth poem, live among untrodden ways. Is it this that made Walpole so rude and Coleridge so mean? Because she worked hard and brought exceptional women to the attention of the world, because unlike Lucy of the poem, she spoke up and she spoke out because she demanded that people see her, that she have a place and a voice in the world. I'm afraid it is so. Women are missing from the historical record, and for some historians this is an accident, perhaps a fit of absence of mind. But some men, perhaps like Walpole and Coleridge, cannot like opinionated, extrovert, independent women. Women have to be quiet, obscure, modest, behaviour that could be summed up in the word ladylike. From there, it's a small shift to the noun lady as another word for woman. The particular behaviour, a repressed personality, comes to mean female. They're not alone in this. For many historians, a woman who is known to history, who is overly visible, is overly audible. This affects their writing of the historical period. Even if a woman has come to prominence, her reputation may not be lasting. The next generation of historians may simply write her out of the record. I keep asking myself, why was the story of Mary Boleyn known to historians, but ignored by them? Why are so many women not celebrated, never mind not celebrated, not even mentioned? And why, when historians do write about women, are women so one-dimensional? I'm going to move at this point, because that row, you can't see me at all, can you, because of this great big thing? So I'll move a bit. <laughs> I think we have to look at the first historical accounts of the medieval period. They're almost all written by men. There are male ambassadors, male diarists, male letter writers, male chroniclers, all taught to write by the church, which was itself male and traditionally fearful and suspicious of women. The church provided two models of women, Eve the temptress and Mary the mother of God. Thus society viewed women as either pure and virginal 
or filled with the carnal lust of the deceitful Eve. In either case, the culture stereotyped them. Whether a woman is being regarded as Eve the temptress or Mary the virgin, this is still to view her in relation to her sexual activity with men. And this is a private activity, not a public or historical act. But when a woman breaks this taboo and is clearly involved in public acts, the medieval historians of her time were at a loss. If she was neither Eve nor Mary, she must be a man. <laughs> so too the playwrights, Lady Macbeth, Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of darest cruelty. Traditional historians don't look for energetic, effective women, and when they find one, they define her as so exceptional as to be a pseudo-man, a woman like Margaret of Anjou, a woman of sufficient forecast, very desirous of renown, full of policy, counsel, comely behaviour, and all manly qualities. This is the start of the interrogation of Queen Margaret of Anjou's femininity that's gone on till our own times. In a very little while, this queen who fought so courageously for her son, her husband, and her house would become not even a man, but a beast, a she-wolf. She-wolf of France, but worse than wolves of France. Women are soft, mild, pitiful, and flexible, Thou, stern, obdurate, flinty, rough, remorseless. All the chronicles written at the time by the Plantagenets or the Tudors were written by a man, often a celibate man, whose vows forbade intimacy with women. I do believe they looked like that. <laughs> Very few of them had ever spoken to the queens whose lives they recorded. Their ignorant and sometimes misogynistic views were translated and edited by later historians, almost always men. Since universities were completely closed to women before 1920, every scholarly history written before that date will have been written by a man, who will have been taught by a man, whose thesis was examined by a man, whose book would be published by a male publisher and reviewed by a male critic. They belong to a tradition of scholarship which is powerful and exclusively male. Their ways are well-trodden indeed, and they have companions on the road. They have signposts. These days, they have metaphorically sat-nav. No wonder they're not very conscious of female sensibility. And of course, it's not just the study of history which excludes women. Let's think about the four estates, the church. It is not admissible to ordain women to the priesthood for very fundamental reasons. These reasons include the example recorded in the sacred scriptures of Christ, choosing his apostles only from among men. The constant practice of the church, which has imitated Christ in choosing only men. And her living teaching authority, which has consistently held that the exclusion of women from the priesthood is in accordance with God's plan for his church. God does not want women to be priests in his church. Amazingly, this statement came out in 1992 from Pope Paul VI, but despite this warning, the Anglican Church allowed the ordination of women as vicars in that year. Now, a full 20 years later, it's struggling to appoint women bishops. The current plan is that if a woman bishop is appointed to a diocese, they then anti-women parishes. And I have to break in here to tell you that a parish which doesn't want a woman is not called sexist. It's not even called bonkers. It's called traditionalist. That's the word to use. Anyway, traditionalist parishes that come under a female bishop are allowed to invite in a male bishop as an alternative on those occasions when they need a bishop. This is called fudge. 30% <laughs> of Anglican vicars are now women, but of them, more than half are either voluntary or unpaid peace, priests. Inexplicably, the paid posts, the posts with stipends, happen to go to men. The Church of England is addressing this to their credit. As for the military, here's a picture of Rosa Shanina, Soviet sniper, World War II. She had 54 confirmed kills. Despite being a member of the gentle sex, she managed to kill all those people. And these days, the British Army has 9.4 serving soldiers who are women. But they are still forbidden from serving in what is known as close combat. And that is, I quote, fighting with units, 
mainly in the infantry, whose key role is to seek out, engage with and kill enemy forces. Do you know, all these years I have not known what the army did. And you can join the army if you're a woman, but you can't actually do army things like killing people. At this state, until 1987, there were never more than 5% of female MPs in the House of Commons. Now, there are 504 male MPs to 145 female MPs. That's 22%. Women doctors, 40% of the doctors in the UK are women. Women surgeons, 8%. Women engineers, lowest in Europe, 9%. Women scientists, 11% of science professors are women. In America, membership of the National Academy of Engineering is the highest honour which can be granted to an engineer. They elected their first woman in 1965. Lillian Gilbreth was an expert in time and motion studies, a qualified engineer and an industrial psychologist whose father did not believe in higher education for his daughters. I quote, he felt they needed only enough knowledge to manage a home gracefully. Lillian won her place to Berkeley and worked alongside her husband. She raised 12 children. I imagine you can see now why she had to become an expert in time and motion studies and how to motivate a workforce. The NAE did not exactly speed ahead with honouring women engineers after Gilbreth. It took them eight years to find another woman who was worthy. And since Lillian was honoured, there have been 2,330 male nominees and 37 women. In the arts, women are to be seen. They're not to be the ones who do the seeing. In 2007, women artists had created just 2% of the pictures of the National Gallery in London. The Metropolitan Museum in New York averaged at about 3%. Women's bodies, indeed especially their naked bodies, are of interest to the museums, but their vision is not. Female musicians are also still discouraged. This is the great Vienna Philharmonic, which only decided to accept women as full members as late as 1997. By 2008, they had made great strides and recruited one. A harpist. Didn't you just know she was going to be a harpist? <laughs> they now have four women musicians, but they are not full members. This quote comes from the orchestra's second violinist, and I have to absolutely not put on a terribly fake Viennese accent here because that would just be offensive. We have a male harpist and two ladies. If you ask how noticeable the gender is with these colleagues, my personal experience is that the instrument is so far away at the edge of the orchestra that it doesn't disturb our emotional unity. The unity I would strongly feel, for example, when the orchestra starts really cooking with a Mahler symphony. There, I sense very strongly and very simply that only men sit round me. And as I said, I would not want to gamble with that unity. Which brings us in a roundabout, untrodden sort of way back to Lucy. This is an artist's rendition of the heroine of William Wordsworth's poem, Lucy, and here's the poem in full. She dwelt among the untrodden ways beside the springs of dove, a maid whom there were none to praise and very few to love. A violet by a mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. She lived unknown, and few could know when Lucy ceased to be, but she is in her grave, and oh, the difference to me. The first thing to observe about Lucy is that like the women musicians of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, she too is better unseen, and nobody loves her. In this sense, she's a great example of ladylike behavior, silent as a violet, distant as a star, unknown, and ultimately dead. <laughs> she is the very, very opposite, the idealised opposite of my great, 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 great Aunt Mary Hayes, who insisted upon being heard, insisted on loving, and demanded love in return. Indeed, Hayes linked those things together and said that as a woman she was a thinking and feeling being. She suggested a new tradition of philosophy which, bo which taught both thought and feeling. This is perhaps why Walpole thought she was like a hyena, greedy, noisy, demanding. Whereas Lucy is an ideal woman who lived unknown among the untrodden ways. And also, Lucy's a maid, she's a virgin. 
While studying for my PhD at this very university, I analysed 120 heroines of novels published in the last half of the 18th century. And of these 120, only two had sexual intercourse outside of marriage. One of them was not even willing. She was raped, Clarissa in the novel by Samuel Richardson. But neither of these two women survived the experience of sex. The double sexual standard where a man is permitted to enjoy sexual intercourse and a woman is forbidden was absolutely demonstrated and enforced in these novels, which showed that any woman who sought a profound emotional experience risked death. Ladies don't have sex before marriage, and if they do, they will die. They will cease to be ladies. Amazingly, in some forms, this view survives today. This is Kimberly Gloudman. This is what she says on her site. I am saving sex for marriage because I know that God has great things destined for me and I don't want to let premarital sex, STDs or anything else stop me from reaching those great things. The best reason for saving sex for marriage is because my future husband and I are worth it. <laughs> I just have to come around and say, it's a shampoo advert, isn't it? She doesn't know, it's just so fabulous. Okay. And I can't resist sharing with you that later on her site, she says that her greatest ambition in this world is to do a, a, an interview with President Clinton. You guys, that's going to cause some problems. I don't think that's going to work myself. But. Lucy, though a maid, dies as a virgin. And clearly this is part of the joy of the poem. The young woman who has made no impact in the world, who has been half hidden from the eye as a violet by a mossy stone, dies before she can be spoiled by attention or by power. Interestingly, the poem was written while William Wordsworth was touring Europe with his sister Dorothy, and Dorothy was no half-hidden violet. This is what Thomas de Quincey said about her. He said, her face was of Egyptian brown. Surely, rarely, in a woman of English birth have I seen a more determinate gypsy tan. Her eyes were not soft, nor were they fierce or bold, but they were wild and startling and hurried in their motion. Her manner was warm even ardent. Her sensibility seemed constitutionally deep, and some subtle fire of impassioned intellect apparently burned within her. This is another woman who believes in thinking and feeling. And some critics have suggested that William Wordsworth on this holiday got thoroughly fed up with his talkative, poetry writing, sensitive, thoughtful, and above all, I imagine, communicating sister. And he composed Lucy to send to his friend and fellow poet Coleridge as a sort of an idealised version of what a woman should be. Other critics have suggested he was imagining the death of a sister that he would have preferred. <laughs> Every woman who wants love, success or a voice in the world has to take on Lucy and take on all the rules about modest retiring and ladylike behaviour and every woman scholar, entrepreneur or activist has to make her own ways. Gifted women have to teach themselves. Gifted women have to work alone, unaware that they're actually part of an unwritten and unrecorded tradition of female scholars. Only now, with feminist historians looking for heroines, do we find the women who did not live alone, but have been forgotten by history. I'd like to share some of my recent discoveries, because I didn't know about these women. This is Enheduanna, a priestess and a poet who lived 4,300 years ago, in 2,300 BC in Sumeria and she wrote the first words that have ever been found. It isn't a shopping list or a calculation for business. It isn't a design or someone sending an order. The oldest piece of writing that historians have found is poetry, poetry written by a woman. This is one of her poems, a hymn to the goddess Inyana. And I like this because it's got roads in it for Lucy. Inyana, to run, to escape, to quiet and to pacify are yours in Yana. To rove around, to rush, to rise up, to fall down, and a companion are yours in Yana. To open up roads and paths, a place of peace for the journey, a companion for the weak are yours in Yana. To keep paths and ways in good order, to shatter earth and make it firm are yours in Yana. To destroy, to build up, to tear out, and to settle are yours in Yana. To turn a man into a woman, and a woman into a man are yours in Yana. Desirability and arousal, goods and property are yours in Yana. Here's someone else I didn't know. 
Lady Murasaki. This is a relatively modern 18th century portrait of the world's first novelist. She is Murasaki Shikibu Niki, and half a century before William of Normandy was invading England and the battle was being recorded on a tapestry, she was composing the first novel ever written. She wrote a series of stories, The Tales of the Genie, and then her novel, The Diary of Lady Murasaki, in about 1010 in Kana, a newly developed writing system for vernacular Japanese. The novel is written like a diary, but includes waka, short poems. May that lady live 1,000 years who guards the flowers. My sleeves are wet with thankful tears as though I had been working in a garden of dewy chrysanthemums. Just briefly, can I skip through Christine de Pizan, which many of you will know. Venetian born 1363, Europe's first professional woman writer, working for money. She completed 41 works during her 30 year career. I have to say that's a very good publication rate. <laughs> Emilie du Châtelet, a French aristocrat born in 1706 who taught herself languages, maths and physics. One of the leading intellectuals of the Age of Enlightenment. A crowning achievement was her translation of Newton's work, Principia Mathematica, one of the few people to understand Newton's work. Her translation has not been improved on in the last 350 years. Her lover, who recognised her grasp of mathematics was greater than his own, is perhaps better known as Voltaire. He wrote to the King Frederick of Prussia that she was a great man whose only fault was being a woman. <laughs> Laura Bassi was born in Bologna in 1711, appointed Professor of Anatomy at the University of Bologna at the age of 21, elected to the Academy of the Institute of Science and the next year was given the Chair of Philosophy, again mainly interested in Newtonian physics. She published 28 papers, the vast majority of these on physics and hydraulics, while raising eight children. Some of these women you may know already, some of may be new to you. Some have been rediscovered only recently as a result of feminist historians going out and looking for women pioneers. But where they all differ so powerfully from male writers, male engineers, philosophers and scientists, is that they could not easily enter a tradition. There's no career route for these women. There was no sisterhood of scholars waiting to greet them, to mentor, patronise and help them. They didn't know the women who had gone before them, the women who followed them didn't know of them. Most of them have been forgotten and are only now being rediscovered. A tradition of scholarship is an exclusively male tradition and though individual women can teach them themselves, fight for the time to study, beg and borrow equipment, what we've not done is establish a separate female culture. There's no enormous state church with powers of patronage and sanctity ruled by a woman. Indeed, the reformation in this country which was powered by enthusiastic and vocal female preachers drove women out of nunneries where they did have some exclusive power. There's no Oxford or Cambridge that is women only and has been women only for thousands of years. And there's no massive self-congratulatory body established since time immemorial which hands out awards to women and gives them a sense of belonging. There is no equivalent of the old boys club. We are, in the phrase of Sheila Rowbottom, hidden from history. This matters to me more than most people, because by accident almost I have become a biographer of more or less unknown women. Not that they're ever completely unknown. For instance, I didn't discover Mary Boleyn any more than Christopher Columbus discovered America. She was there in the footnotes of history books all along. Her picture hung in Hever Castle, though nobody had taken the trouble to identify it. And everyone knew about her sister. But when I made her the heroine of a novel which became a bestseller, she became the heroine of a BBC film, and then a Hollywood film, and then historians started to look for her. And now she has two scholarly biographies to her name, art historians have identified the portrait as hers, and she stepped out of the shadows of being a woman in history to being a genuine historical character. Up she pops in Showtime's The Tudors. And actually, this publicity photograph, I think, explains why there was so little work done. <laughs> explains why there was so little work done on the women of Henry VIII's period other than on the wives. There are too many women already. They've gone over the 20% barrier, which we seem to instinctively observe in politics, science and the arts. Six wives and two daughters, that's quite enough women in any period. We can't be getting into researching mistresses or mothers as well. 
We don't know Mary Boleyn's exact date of birth. Amazingly, we don't know Anne Boleyn's exact date of birth either. Girl babies are born into obscurity, and even if they achieve extraordinary things in their lifetime, when they die, their reputation often dies with them. For there is no role of honour for women. There are no elite associations which call for a statue of a high-achieving woman or puts her portrait in their dining club. All of the ways which male professional associations memorialise their founders or their leaders are silent about women until women start to be members, and that only tends to happen quite late in the 20th century. But surely now, now that women are engineers and scientists, literary lions, town planners, now we see women getting credit where it's due. We don't have to be praised for being obscure, virginal, or living among untrodden ways. We don't have to be pretty and modest and self-effacing, do we? Amazingly, women still attract blame if they appear to seek power. The coverage of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, for example, had been notable for its emphasis on her appearance, with endless scathing comments on her unwomanly ambition and her coldly tenacious style. In criticising Mrs Thatcher as a surrogate man, feminists mean that she has betrayed women, not only politically, but spiritually. Anti-feminists muttered the same thing. She is abhorrent, anathema, unfeminine. She is herself destroying what is most precious and treasured about womanhood in the pursuit of mere manly power. We've made great strides towards equality. I'm deeply conscious of it. My grandmother was a suffragette. No, alas, that's Emily Pankhurst being arrested. Uh, my grandmother was, this is my grandmother, probably one of the worst suffragettes uh, who ever failed to organise a meeting. If the movement had depended upon her, we would still be selling kisses in the street on polling day. My grandmother attended one suffragette meeting and her husband, my grandfather, told her that if she attended another, he would turn her out of the house. So she never went. <laughs> but perhaps accidentally, perhaps on purpose, she raised independent daughters. We don't ever talk about my Aunt Molly, who ended up pretending to be a retired prima ballerina in Canada and answered only to the title Madame Molly. <laughs> but my mother was triumphantly liberated by the war. She expressed herself in her staunch independence and raised both of her daughters to have a trade, determined that we should be able to earn our own livings and not depend on a husband. So we have made progress. For instance, this is the richest woman on the Sunday Times Rich List this year. She's Kirsty Bertarelli, and she has half of a £6.87 billion pharmaceutical business at last. We can close this celebration on women's achievement with a billionaire woman pharmacist. Alas, no. The billionaire pharmacist is her husband, Ernesto. Kirsty is a former Miss England and a songwriter. So let us celebrate the achievements of women on this International Women's Day. We've come a long way. Clearly, we still have quite a long way to go. Let's remember the countries of the world where women are even today, denied an education or the right to participate fully in life. And let's remember the women of our own country who got their educations and their training despite everything against them. And I'd like to close with this one really cheering but surprising fact. Men are six times more likely than women to be struck by lightning. <laughs>
trying to get into the discussion, but that was, uh, yes, it's on. Is it on? Yeah? Hello? Switched on. Good. Um, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And what a wonderful um, panorama of women's combination, really, of, of achievement um, and obscurity. I've just been thinking about, um, I'm going to cheat and just ask one question myself before we open up to the audience, but I've been thinking um, about your novels, which of course are very often um, built around female characters who have been unexplored or underexplored by conventional history, like uh, Mary Boleyn. Um, you've also written a very powerful book about Catherine of Aragon, the first wife of, of Henry VIII, who was indeed a very... Um, um, underexplored and, and sort of unknown, really, character in 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 um, in, in English history. Um, although she features in a play by Shakespeare, she features very much as a kind of sad victim. She has one very good speech, um, and was in fact a very complicated character. And I just wonder um, how much, um, when you are writing about women like that, how much do you? Uh, is it possible to find out all that you need in order to write a novel about a figure, say, like Catherine of Aragon? Or um, do you need to invent quite a bit in order, to, in order to make a complete story because of those gaps in the historical record that you were talking about? Um, there's really two answers to that. One is that it's called historical fiction because it's both bits of a very interesting art, or if you insist, one of them's a science. Uh, it's got to be history, it's got to be fiction as well. It wouldn't be a novel if it didn't have a substantial fictional component. So it has to obey all sorts of novelish rules about narrative and things like the arc of the story and what you want the characters to do and their development. Having said that, almost everybody, you can find out enough about them to be able to give, in a sense, the outline of their life, which you're then going to fictionalise. We don't know really anything about anybody's private life until people start keeping diaries, and they don't tend to keep diaries until about the 18th century. Mm -hmm. So even if you were writing about a really well-known man, you might know where he was and what he was doing, but you wouldn't know why he was doing it in terms of what, what he would have said why he was doing it. So you have to extrapolate from the historical facts. Some people, there's an awful lot about them. Obviously, someone like Elizabeth I, mm. you know where she is. Once she's queen, you know where she is almost exactly all the time. Um, someone like Mary Boleyn just disappears mm. from the historical record mm. for years at a time. But then you, then you look at what you do know, and if she, you know, if she gives birth to a baby at one point, you know that she's pregnant previous to that. And one of the fictions that I wrote in The Other Boleyn Girl is a scene between her and her sister Anne when she's banned from court. We know she was banned from court. We don't know why, but actually it occurs at about the stage that the pregnancy would start showing, and I think it may well be that that's when Anne did it. So in a sense, the, the boundaries between historical fiction and reconstruction and supposition are often very, very blurred. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Right now, I, I know that there are going to be um, a lot of people um, wanting to get in and ask questions. Would anyone like to start? Yep. Oh, it's a gentleman. <laughs> As ever in Scotland, it's always a man who speaks first. No. Um, yeah, could you wait for the microphone to reach you, please, or everyone won't be able to hear the question. Do you regard men as one of nature's failures? Um, at, at, at doing what? You see, it's... Oh, being. No, no, they clearly they be very nicely. I mean, they be incredibly successfully. It seems to me they dominate, you know, extraordinary amounts of resources. So in terms of their... Exi no, no. I mean, I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm you know, very fond of men. I have a son. I have a husband. Uh, my husband's here. <coughs> what can I say? I mean, I have a great admiration for the gender. Um, there are times when I think that they have a disproportionate amount of influence. And uh, I think all of the talk would indicate that. But I'm not anti-man in any way, uh, any more than I would be anti any other form of life, which I don't necessarily understand. But I can, <laughs> but I can observe and sometimes admire. So there was a gentleman here. Yeah. Um, I have two kind of related questions. As I understand it, um, 
The celebration of International Women's Day started in New York City, 1998-1999 possibly, when a group of women textile or garment workers uh, who were on strike against terrible wages and working conditions um, had a kind of lock-in strike. And uh, the, fa the factory they'd locked themselves in, somehow I think a fire started, possibly by thugs um, um, uh, paid by the employers, and a number of women died. And the international socialist organizations, I forget exactly what they were called, decided soon after that that if socialist parties anywhere in the world came to power, they would remember the day on which this happened as a way of commemorating the struggles of these women textile workers. And that's, I mean, that happened then in the Scandinavian countries and this, the uh, Soviet bloc countries and Italy and so on. Now, why, I'm a bit curious, is, there seems to be a, a shyness in mentioning that's how it started. It was part of a wider struggle. And um, if, right, um, I find your lecture very interesting, very stimulating. I completely agree with you. But if you're going to, um, how can I put it? Um, unfortunately, uh, white women, especially white women of higher social status, have had some possibly complicit, small but complicit role in other forms of oppression, racism, imperialism, class oppression, and to conduct a dialogue as if, you know, the only problem for women was men, I, it, the dialogue is too simple. You need to bring, other the, bring into the dialogue, you know, to treat the subject comprehensively and accurately and realistically, you need to look at the intersection between um, uh, and women's role in other forms of sometimes oppressing other people. I totally agree with you. Actually, I stand corrected. Uh, I succumbed, as I occasionally do, to the joy of the incredible humour which strikes me about, it's, you know, any oppression is A, terrible, and B, it has these absurdities about it. And uh, I absolutely hold my hand up to being taken by some of the absurdities and wanting to share them with you this evening. You're absolutely right. The, the source of International Women's Day could not be more serious, and it is a very, very, very complicated situation. But I assure you, I don't think men are the only people to blame. And, uh, I certainly think that women have all sorts of responsibilities in terms of their position in class and race oppression as well. You. You're welcome. Anyone else? They do that. Um, you've written about Mary, Queen of Scots. Would you ever consider more Scottish women for your novels than just sort of southern English women? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Scottish history student, so I love reading more Thank about you. it. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to write about English women because I live in England, because I'm English, and there is something about, I think, really being impregnated, in a sense, with your culture. And so, you know, people also say to me, won't you do, you know, there's a list of, of characters that people long for you to do. They say, won't you do Ella of Aquitaine? And I say, honestly, no, uh, because I don't know enough about European history. Won't you do Isabella and Ferdinand? Uh, you know, also, I don't think I'd do Scottish women because I do think there is, I do think it's a authentically separate and different culture. And I don't really want to go dancing in there, um, you know, with a lack of sensitivity and complexity which I am tragically prone. Um, <laughs> um, and also, the other thing is I'm currently working on the Plantagenets, who are just keep throwing up these extraordinarily fascinating women. And I'm afraid there may be enough in English history to take me through to retirement. Um, <laughs> so that's the plan at the moment. Thanks for the question. Thanks very much. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm 
I'd like to ask a supplementary about the Plantagenets, actually, because in writing about them, do you find you keep stumbling across Shakespeare? You quoted Shakespeare on, on Queen Margaret there. And, and uh, certainly in Scottish history, with the, with the famous example of the Scottish play, people are constantly blundering to these incredibly powerful sort of archetypes and images that Shakespeare creates through his poetry, which can be very hard to shift. Yeah, the funny thing is Shakespeare and I have been actually, you know, daggers drawn now for <laughs> several years. His view of Richard III is incredibly yeah. prejudiced and incredibly critical. And most of the women that I really like, that I'm really interested in, whose lives I'm researching, Shakespeare uses in that the whole of the history cycle plays, the, the Henry plays, very much as kind of symbols of different things, you know, the, the grieving mother, the grieving widow. And, uh, of course, I'm interested in them uh, m much less as kind of symbols of female behaviour, much more as, as the characters. So Shakespeare and I are really fallen out at the moment. Um, <laughs> I'm sure he's really just wretched about it. You know? <laughs> Lady here. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in your hyena, a great, 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 great aunt. Mm. Is, is that a story that is known in your family, or have you found out about that? Is it, uh, it, so did it influence you right from childhood, or have you spent some time actually finding out about her subsequently? This, this actually isn't planted, because it's such a great question for me. <laughs> when I was at this very university, my supervisor, Geoffrey Carnell, who did me the honour to be here this evening, uh, it's terrifying talking in front of him, I have to say. This is my supervisor, I go like, I know nothing. And in a minute he's going to very quietly say, I think you need to look at that a little more. Um, <laughs> was clearing out his library and said to me, I'd asked him to write a reference for me and I'd given one of my family members as another reference and her name was Mary Wedd. She was a, a lecturer at uh, Queen Mary College then and an expert on Wordsworth, as it happens. And he found in his, he recognised the name, he found in his library a book on Mary Hayes, the collected letters of Mary Hayes, which had been collected by uh, A.F. Wedd, who was her great niece, who was my great aunt Anne. So I knew my great aunt Anne, I knew nothing about Mary Hayes, I had no idea that in my family there was an 18th century feminist. And the more I, and then I started to find out about Mary Hayes, and to my amazement, there she is in the 18th century, researching women who aren't very well known, writing about them, writing novels as well. And I have reproduced in many ways her career path um, in a much smaller way in this century that she did then. And it seems to me quite a, a, a quite extraordinary, either coincidence, unless you choose to believe, as I do in my moments of greatest grandeur, that the, the muse has descended upon me and I am in fact her. Um, <laughs> That's not too insane a thing to do because I, I have to assure you that uh, uh, most gatherings of this sort of size, someone comes up to me and tells me they're Mary Queen of Scots and that only I have understood their tragic story. So reincarnation and me are, are old friends in this subject. <laughs> Lady there. Yeah. Are you planning a biography of Mary Hayes? Uh, no, I'm not, but that's a really interesting idea. I th she's, been, she's currently of great interest to people, and her biographer and expert editor, um, they're republishing the female biography, uh, both online and in a massive uh, Chawton House edition. And I'm writing a couple of the character notes in it, so I'm writing in her book, which is really great. Um, but there are other bet greater experts than I am on Mary Hayes. But I do claim... I'm. <laughs> closest. <laughs> there is another lady here. Anyone else? Hello, yes, that I think uh, partially answered my question in a way because I was going to ask you um, why was it you went for novels? Why didn't you, you know, you did a PhD, you could have easily turned into a wonderful, you know, <laughs> scholar and you could have written prop, sort of non fiction. You'd have gone down that way. Why? Uh, sorry, it almost came out, didn't it? It almost came out. <laughs> <laughs> and, but why did you write the novel? Why did you write the novel? Come back to Edinburgh University, immediately you get the question. Well, firstly, I absolutely adore novels. I read novels for pleasure. I love the novel form. I think you can tell stories, uh, you can tell history in the novel in a way which is really quite amazing. In terms of teaching history, if you think I should, uh, 
I've got an awful lot more readers as a novelist than I would have done as a historian. And a lot of those people, I promise you, write to me and tell me they go on to do history courses and some of them go to universities and some of them are women. So, you know, ticked all of those boxes. I really, really love writing novels and, uh, you know, it pays fantastically. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm interested in the archival sources that you use to write your novels, and are there women that you would like to write about, but you can't find enough in the historical sources to write about them? Um, because I'm working mostly in the Tudors and the Plantagenets, I don't... I, th there are very, very few archival sources anyway. Almost all of them have been translated and worked over. So I don't tend to go and read original documents. I don't need to read original documents because people like Polydor Virgil and um, the Chronicles have been republished. So it's quite easy to get to the earliest documents, the contemporary documents with the people. They don't mention women very much at all. They're not, uh, they're, they simply aren't interested in anyone who isn't probably effective in the battlefield. You know, a lot of this is, is stories of war. Um, you do get, I mean, someone like Margaret of Anjou, does appear quite a lot in the record because she's incredibly active and politically effective. But someone like Anne Neville, the daughter of Warwick the Kingmaker, who I'm working on at the moment, not very much on her at all. But you can track her because she's generally either with her husband or she's generally with her father or she's generally in someone else's care. So you can usually find out where she is. Sometimes you can find out what she's doing. Every now and then you get something wonderful, like a wardrobe record, and you know the colour of her dress on a specific day. That's a wonderful moment. That really is, for a novelist, that's just a little bit of detail you really want. Um, but the rest of it, uh, in a sense, that's where the fiction comes in. But the, it seems to me that sometimes the way I'm working as a novelist is a bit like working as a historian, trying to kind of do a detective job that you go like... The great, the great tradition is that uh, she is living with her sister and uh, her brother-in-law and she somehow escapes from their house disguised as a kitchen maid and then she, a few months later she's married to Richard III and people who don't like Richard III says he kidnaps her and holds her and forces her to marry him for her fortune. If you actually look at how she gets to be with them, they actually rather kidnap her from a battle. I think they hold her, possibly against her will, in order to have her fortune. I'm sure she escapes from them under her own steam because I don't see that, that anybody could kidnap her from their house, which is a pretty well secure place. So you then start saying, oh, well, maybe this isn't a woman who's like carried around like a parcel and goes from father to sister to kidnapped by husband and then poisoned. Uh, allegedly. Um, maybe this is actually a woman who's quite active in her own life and goes like, I don't really want to be stuck here in this house virtually held to ransom. I've got to find someone who's big enough and tough enough to defend my livelihood, my income, my inheritance. The only person that would be is Richard, who subsequently becomes Richard III. So there is the material. A lot of the material is very scanty, but you can read from the material, and that's, that's really the, 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 the way that I write historical fiction, is to start with the, the archival material and the secondary sources, and then, in a sense, pull the story out of that with supposition. Thank you. One down here. Just, just wait for the mic. Come to you. So was it always your intention to become a novelist, or when you started out on your PhD, were you planning to just go into historical scholarships? Or yeah, no, my, my, my story is a tragic one, but brief. <laughs> um, I was doing my, the first part of the tragedy, again, I refer to my supervisor, took me four years rather than three. Uh, partly my fault, their, the responsibility should be shared, I think I'd like to say at this point. Um, <laughs> It was an extensive rewriting period, which I think was completely unnecessary. Um, so, <laughs> so it took four years. And at the end of it, I really thought that I would be a scholar working in a university, and that is absolutely what I wanted to do. I longed to do that more than anything else. Margaret Thatcher, who I made a very nice tribute to 
earlier was running the country at the time. And first of all, she closed the shipyards, then she closed the coal mines, then she closed the 18th century English literature departments. <laughs> and I have to say, not a miner turned out for me uh, when I couldn't get a place to work anywhere in the UK. And uh, I remember saying to Geoffrey, actually, I don't know how I'm going to get a job unless I push you downstairs. And he said, the post is frozen. It's not me. If you push me downstairs and kill me, there won't be a post. I said, OK, then. On, on that understanding, I will spare you on this occasion. Um, so uh, I didn't have a job. I was just trying to figure out what I would do. And while I was figuring out what to do, I had just read, as part of my PhD thesis, uh, 200 18th century novels which was a long, long, long period to go through. And it just meant that by accident, I had, in a sense, given myself the best apprenticeship you could possibly do in terms of, the 18th, in terms of how to write a novel. And that, that was how I, that was, I, I started writing just for pleasure. And that was my first novel, and it was published you know, with really remarkable success. I was very lucky. Well, I really like your books, and what I like is that it's not just about women, but your books are also about women who had a strong um, impact on world history as behind the stage actors. Um, I was however wondering if the historians are criticizing you or disagreeing with you on the role that you um, give to these women. Um, I'm sorry to say that the response of historians is uh, very mixed. And I wish it were very much based on historical relevance or accuracy, but I regret to say it is not. Um, so it's very personal. So Eric Ives, who is the really excellent <laughs> biographer of Anne Boleyn, said to me, we were at a conference together, and he said very, very kindly, I have to thank you. And I said, oh, yes. And he said, because my biography of Anne Boleyn, which had been out of print in the States for 10 years, has just gone into publication again, <laughs> and it's just charted. And that was when the other Boleyn Girl film came out. So Eric Ives likes me a lot. Um, <laughs> David Starkey doesn't like me at all. But then, David Starkey doesn't like anybody. So <laughs> it doesn't really matter. It's just one of those things. Um, in terms of rising, you know, raising the prominence of women and telling the story of women in history, I think, by and large, there's a kind of general understanding that that's a, a worthwhile piece of historical work, which it's valid to do either as a novelist or as a scholar. And last year, I published, for the first time, uh, a nonfiction. Whoever wanted me to write history, I did it last year. Um, I wrote, a, a, with two other historians, a book of uh, non-fiction, a biography of a woman that I'd written about in fiction because there was nothing else available on her so that people who wanted to read the history can read it. Um, I don't, the more I work on it, the, the less and less I see a massive divide between history, which is really written very much in a novelish way, consciously by historians who want to appeal to a popular audience and who want to make it readable, who want to tell a story, and novelists who write with a lot of history. I think that it's much more a continuum and not really any more <coughs> two very, very clear separate disciplines. And I quite, I quite welcome that. I think that's quite interesting. I think I'm now going to do a small audience survey because while Philippa was speaking, sadly, I'm much too old to have been able to read Philippa's books when I was uh, young, since she is younger than I am. But I remember novelists like Jean Plady and Anya Seaton, who's, who wrote wonderful novels. Jean Plady's were uh, 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 Tudor novels, um, um, sometimes on, on similar subjects to Philippa's. Anya Seaton wrote a wonderful novel about the second wife of John of Gaunt, Catherine de Rouet, which I'll never forget, the way it brought that kind of period of the Middle Ages. Alive. And I'm just wondering, um, and I want honest answers here because I know a lot of you are academics, but how many people in the audience would say that they have read a historical novel which has triggered in them a real interest in a historical period which has stayed with them? Yeah, I mean, that's a very high proportion when you think of the number of um, history books that people have to read in the mm -hmm. course of their academic studies and so on. It's, a, it, it's an amazingly rich and fertile genre. Right, we've got, we're coming to the end of our time, but if there's one or two more questions. Yep, lady in the middle in the purple jacket, thank you. Uh, well, in your research, what has been um, one of the more interesting um, things that you've discovered, either a historical figure or like even an anecdote or whatever? It's, um, 
I'd have to go back to Mary Bolin. She was the... I wasn't planning to work on Mary Bolin at all. I didn't know she existed. I was in a library in London, and uh, I thought I was going to do a novel on the Tudor Navy, something about piracy, something around that sort of period. I was, so I was looking at books about the Tudor Navy, about shipbuilding, about that, and I opened one book, and it said, and there, there is an account of Henry VIII launching a ship called Mary Bolin. And I so much didn't know about her that I thought that's got to be a mistake because I haven't heard of Mary Bolin. So I looked up, this is, this is a real, I mean, those of you who are students, I actually did some research, which is such a good thing to do. Um, I actually bothered to go to another book, look in the back, looked up Mary Bolin, came across this story of the sister to Anne Boleyn, who was Henry VIII's lover while Anne Boleyn was in France, who was absolute, dominated the court, who had two children, one a boy, which she called Henry, probably by him, and who was like the centre of the court until Anne came back from France and everybody fell in love with Anne. And Mary was uh, in confinement and she went into confinement as like Queen Bee and she came out and she was to be Anne's lady-in-waiting. And I thought, that is such a fantastic novel. Why has nobody in the last 400 years realised that that is like just the best story you could possibly find out? And uh, I was in the London Library, and I did that thing that those of you who study or work in exams do. I went like that, you know, round the books. Like, <laughs> I didn't want anybody getting hold of it before I'd published it. And when I'd come out to like, talk to readers and people would say to me, what are you working on at the moment? I would say, I'm stuck. <laughs> Lady there, um, yeah. There she is. You mentioned that your um, great, 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 great aunt tried to bring um, women who'd lived before her um, into prominence, and you're doing the same thing 200 years later. Is someone going to have to do this again in 200 years' time? <laughs> um, That's a great question. Yeah, I think they will. I think they will uh, because I think we still, as women as a culture i think we still don't dish out enough awards celebrate enough preserve enough of course all the media's changed so much so uh, provided that all of this uh, you know stuff you young people do all this digital stuff if it doesn't melt you know which it might in my opinion um, if it doesn't melt then we've got a fantastic record that we'll be able to access so I think in a sense the records will be better preserved of what we're doing now but I think in a way uh, preserving and celebrating the achievements of women is something that we have to do we have to continue doing and if we don't 200 years from now they'll have to do it all over again and I really hope that my great 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 niece is standing here and saying <coughs> Philippa Gregory Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.